So the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about stories and, and set the stage. I think we're at a crucial inflection point in the world, culturally and philosophically. I think we're on the dawn of a new set of realizations, a new set of realizations that will return us to our fundamentals. I think the reason that we have a culture war raging in the West, why there's so much instability, is because something new is struggling to be born or reborn. And I want to explain the reason for that first. And the reason is that the Enlightenment view of the world, which has guided our technological and scientific endeavor, our conceptual endeavor, our philosophical endeavor for a few hundred years, is there's something about it that's wrong, like deeply wrong. And that error is making itself manifest in the scientific community because I would say now that scientists themselves from a multitude of different disciplines understand that the idea that we see the world as a place of facts or that we see the world as rational creatures or that you can even see the world that way is wrong. Wrong. And I believe that it's been demonstrated to be wrong. It's, this isn't a matter of mere philosophical opinion anymore, although it's also that. One example, for example, is that the newest artificial intelligence systems that we've designed, the large language models that have burst onto the stage in the last year or thereabouts, ChatGPT, the catastrophic Gemini that Google so foolishly launched, Elon Musk's Grok. These systems are trained like human beings are trained. They have an aim. They have a purpose. They were trained with reward and punishment, so to speak. They're approximations to a target. They see the world through a structure of value that they have absorbed from human beings. To make the world's smartest linguistic machines, we had to inculcate in them a structure of value. Okay, and so, and we produced machines now that can engage in discourse, that can use language in a way that's virtually indistinguishable from the human, and that's going to become radically indistinguishable from the human very, very rapidly. And they're not programmed like lists of rules. They're not programmed like ordinary thinking machines. They're programmed the same way that human beings learn. They're programmed with aim. They have an ethos and an ethic. We can't orient ourselves in the world with the facts. We can't follow the science because science isn't a leader. Science doesn't establish our aims. Our aims are established using mechanisms of perception and emotion and thought that aren't in themselves scientific. We're aiming at something. Why can't we orient ourselves in the world with the facts. Well, the simplest explanation for that is that there are too many facts. There's as many facts as there are phenomena. More, actually. There's as many facts as there are possible combinations of phenomena. You drown in the facts. When you're confused in your own life and things are chaotic and you're anxious, it's because a plethora of possibilities is making itself manifest in front of you and you don't know which way to turn. You don't have a clear direction. You don't have a clear aim. There's no way of simplifying the world so that you can act in it. We know, for example, that to perceive the world, you have to obliterate from your consciousness almost everything that you could see, because otherwise you, you're overwhelmed. We know even that the hallucinogens who are being studied in, in, with increasing intensity in recent years interfere with your normal perception such that they bring to consciousness a plethora of things that under normal circumstances you ignore. And the consequence of that is is influx of a sense of overwhelming significance and meaning, but at the same time a kind of paralysis of action, because when everything becomes infinitely meaningful, there's no straightforward way of moving forward. When you're in a restaurant with someone on a first date and you're focusing on the conversation and actions of your date in a sea of competing conversations, you zero out everything that you could be attending to in every other table, all the competing thoughts in your imagination, all the things you could be bringing to mind to zero in with like laser pinpoint accuracy on what it is that your partner in conversation is doing. And you do that in the world all the time. You make one thing at a time of pinnacle importance and you arrange everything else in the world at every moment that you perceive around that thing that you've made of pinnacle importance. That's how you see the world. And I don't mean think about the world. This is under thought. It's more profound. It's what you do when you actually see. If I decide to do something 
straightforward, like walk from here to the stairs on the stage, and I set my aim. I don't perceive any of you in consequence because the fact of your existence is irrelevant to my purpose, and you're gone. None of the facts of the stage that I could attend to are relevant and perceptible anymore except insofar as their pathways or facilitators or obstacles to my journey forward. If I'm looking to the stairs, I see the chairs, but not as places to sit. I see them as obstacles that I have to circumvent in order to attain my aim. Everything that you see in the world makes itself manifest in accordance with your aim. And and that's a radically, revolutionarily different way of conceptualizing the world than the notion that you take the facts and you sort them despite their infinite number and calculate your way with the facts rationally forward. That's not what you do. All right, here's a proposition to contemplate. It's another proposition that has revolutionary significance. It'll explain all sorts of things that you know to be true, but don't know why they're true. The description of the structure through which you see the world is a story. That's what a story is. Okay, so now this explains many things that are otherwise left as mysteries or, or side effects. I read a book by Steven Pinker once. Pinker's an Enlightenment rationalist from Harvard, and a good guy and very smart, and much of what he says is extraordinarily useful, but he believes, for example, that our proclivity to enjoy and tell stories is like a side effect of something more fundamental cognitively. It's, it's the story as entertainment theory. You go to a movie because it's, it's fun. You, you read a book of fiction to your child because it's fun. It's, it's not core to the element of the way that you exist in the world. It's mere entertainment. It misses the point, that theory. Why is it entertaining? Why can you teach children with stories? If, the, if you get the story right for a child, you can capture the child's interest and you can integrate almost any form of learning into the story. And the child will be captivated by that. When children play, pretend play, which they do spontaneously, they spontaneously dramatize the world. They spontaneously make stories out of their roles and their destinies. And that captures them. That forms the basis of their friendships. That's why children want to play so frenetically, is that they're practicing modeling the world. When you go see a movie, it's not that you want to be entertained, although it is entertaining. That's not why you're there. It's not for fun either. That's easy to understand and to, and to see. What's fun about a horror movie? Dead serious. It's like people will be so afraid in a horror movie that they'll cover their eyes. They'll hide behind the chair in front of them. They'll ask themselves afterwards why they even put themselves through it. And yet they'll line up and pay to do it. Well, why would you line up and pay to torture yourself? Well, because you want to know how to deal with what's horrifying. And you want to practice that in a way, if you can, that isn't in itself fatal. You want to expose yourself to the catastrophes of existence so that you're prepared when those catastrophes come along. You want to expose yourself to the, the predators that lurk everywhere. You want to inure yourself against what's disgusting and contaminating because you're going to have to deal with it. You want to expose yourself to what's frightening so that you can find the courage within you to deal with what's frightening. And that's part of the instinct to develop and expand your competence. And it's in that expansion of competence and skill that occurs as a consequence of that voluntary exposure that the entertainment is situated. The reason that's entertaining is because it's part of the manner in which you expand yourself. And you can do that in the direction of what's dark and terrible, just as you can in the direction of, say, what's heroic.